Welcome to the KX Country Clubhouse. Uh, my name is Mikey from KX 94.7, and today it is my absolute privilege to welcome Keith Urban to the clubhouse. Keith, how are you, my hey, friend? Mike, good to see you, man. Really good to see you. Nature is, uh, is slowly but surely healing. We're slowly but surely getting back to normal. You're doing okay? My relationship to this reality is always changing. I've gone through everything from accepting it to hating it to being frustrated by it to being inspired by it to being completely saddened and depressed by it to being everything and and then forgetting about it and then back into it and it's just been a roller coaster so I don't know if anybody can relate to that but that's kind of where it's been. Oh I think a lot more people can relate to it than you think. Uh, the last time we saw you, you were co-hosting the ACMs. Heck of a job, by the way. Thank you. I, I can't wait till we have an actual audience in there, though. It's a, it's a very different feeling playing to uh, a bunch of empty seats. What's the, uh, what's the process like for you when preparing for an event like that? Are there any similarities to when you're preparing for a show on tour? No, because it's... Uh... Obviously, it's it's scripted, so there's a there's a sort of a sense of getting the flow of everything, but also being able to be in the moment, as well. Um, but you know, I think when I signed up to do it, it was going to be in Las Vegas in April of 2020. That that was that was meant to be our very first show together, and of course that got moved to September of 2020, and then it got moved to Nashville. And there was no audience and everything started to be very very different but um having done it that first time in 2020 i was really grateful first of all that the acms went ahead they figured out a way to do it and and that, that now they were able to get it back on track this season and put it back into april and of course doing it in nashville was turned out to be a blessing because we could do it in multiple venues you know take advantage of mm. So many great places in Nashville, not just the Opry House, but of course Ryman Auditorium and Bluebird Cafe and down by the river and Broadway got hit and it was just kind of, we were kind of everywhere. So it was a great opportunity to, to remind people of, of um, how fun Nashville is as well. Congrats on uh, One Too Many, recently going number one here north of Thanks, the border. Thanks, Thank uh, you. Pink was, Pink was always the end game for that song, correct? Yeah, I mean, I've always wanted to sing with her. So it's just a case of hoping one day to find a song that I think would suit her. And, and I said, I, I, the crazy part is I didn't really know her that well. Um, but I managed to get a hold of her and said, I have this song. Do you want to hear it? Sent it to her. And she said, Oh, I love this song. Yeah, I'll definitely want to sing this. And this was February, March of 2020. <laughs> you can see where that story is going. And then all of a sudden, oh, <laughs> everything went quiet. I'd already put my vocal on the song. The song was finished. It just needed the crown jewel of pink to sing on it. And it was done. And uh, February, March came and went. April came, May, June. And the, I watched these months rolling by just thinking, oh, my gosh, I hope she, I hope she still wants to do this song, you know. And... Uh, Somewhere around June, July, she got her vocal on the song finally. And it was just when the first time I heard it, I couldn't believe it. She's born, born to oh, sing The it. song is incredible. And after hearing the song for the last few months, there's no other voice that you can hear on that song alongside yours than Pink's. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I, I hope we get to do other things in the future because I love singing with her. Yeah, we hope so too. So I'm going to throw a number out at you. 27 as in 27 number ones in canada what does that number mean to you <laughs> that's insane <laughs> that's it's <laughs> and this is canada too but i gotta i gotta give massive props to canada across the board because the amount of those number ones that happened um not only first in canada and it's the same with one too many First country in the world for one too many to go number one. But there's been songs that have only gone number one for me in Canada. So uh, whatever's going on between me and you guys, I, I am very grateful. And uh, we'll always keep coming and touring. We love you, man. Over two decades of hits. Do you remember where you were and what it felt like the first time you heard one of your songs on the radio? Yeah, um, it was in Australia 
it was 1991, <laughs> I think somewhere around there. <laughs> uh, I won this talent quest in 1990 and, and the main prize was you got to record a single for EMI Records and I'd written a couple of songs. So I went in and recorded these two songs and I was playing a gig in a very small town and staying at a motel. And before the show, I was getting ready in my little motel, my crappy motel room. And they had one of those little clock radios, you know, that's bolted to the side table so you don't steal it. <laughs> and it's tuned to the local country station. And my song came on. And that's the very first time I heard me coming out of a, a speaker of a radio ever. It was, it was surreal. So from your first single to one of your first gigs, you got to tell us about this airport baggage claim show that you played. <laughs> <laughs> yeah woo, rock and roll uh, <laughs> uh yeah so it was it, it was in a, a town called tamworth oddly enough the first town i heard my that was the town i was in when i heard my first song all those years before oh, that cool. but uh they'd opened a, a regional airport had one baggage carousel and somehow we ended up getting a gig playing at this airport and I had a three piece band at the time called the ranch. And so we got to the airport sort of lunchtime. It was a, it was a daytime gig and they set us up on the little, that little strip of carpet, you know, where the baggage the conveyor belt thing goes around. There's usually a little raised mm -hmm. piece of carpet right above it. So on that little Island <laughs> right there is where that was our stage. So we set a tiny little bass drum and snare drum there. Bass player and me had wireless, guitar and bass and we had a mic stand and up we go <laughs> <we, laughs> the airport manager we, we ch tested the gear and um it sounded fine and so i said to the airport manager who was standing there i go when, when do we start he goes start now i was like there's nobody <laughs> here he goes oh they'll, they'll, they'll drift over and i'm like okay so we <laughs> we start playing <laughs> sure enough you know Guy comes over and then another couple of people come over and then a few more people and they're all smiling and saying, I'm like, this, this is not bad. It's a pretty good gig. And then we had about eight, nine, ten people. And I was like, this is pretty happening. And we're halfway through the song. Next minute, ah, ah. <laughs> all these bags started coming out. <laughs> they were just there to get, they got their bags sort of waved and off they went with their luggage. And there was, you know, by the, by the end of that conveyor belt session, there was nobody there by the end of the song. Um, so I just jumped on the conveyor belt on my wireless guitar and went for a ride around the thing because we just thought it was the worst gig we'd ever done in our lives. <laughs> well, I guess before you play the uh, the stadiums in the arenas, you got to play the baggage claim, right? Got to play the baggage claim. Yeah. And I, I still to this day, if I'm at a baggage claim and I see that little strip of carpet, I chuckle a little bit. I'm like, I played there. <laughs> I, uh, I posted on Twitter earlier today that I was uh, I was getting to talk to you, and uh, one of your fans tweeted in a question. This one from Libby Jet 1223. She wants to know if there were if there's any thought or if you had any thought about doing a weekly or a monthly podcast for your fans. Oh, that would be fun. Um, a podcast that would be unusual, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> everybody's got podcast i would like to do some kind of podcast i really would um particularly interviewing other people because i really I, I i'm very fascinated by all kinds of people in different walks of life for different reasons so um yeah at some point some kind of thing i think we we would we would get going i love the opportunity to be able to talk to our audience um mm -hmm. in that and especially in those one-on-one -on -one, capacities too because i'm always interested in uh everything really like particularly when people come to the shows where did you come from tell, tell me a bit about what was happening before you came to the gig and you know all that sort of stuff i'm fascinated by all of that excellent and i know you're a busy guy so we're going to send you out on this fun one you've got one of the best jobs in the world but if you were forced to switch jobs with the main character of the last TV show or movie you watched, what's your new gig? <laughs> oh my gosh. That is one of the most colorful questions I've ever had come at me, Mikey. Um, let me think here. <laughs> so based on whatever the last movie that I watched? Movie or TV show? 
Right. Well, apparently I would be uh, down on my luck living with my family in a flea bitten motel room in Schitt's Creek. That's where I'd be. <laughs> I'd be Johnny Rose. <laughs> and we're going to send you out on that one, Keith Urban. It's always a pleasure, man. Thank you so much for taking your time out of the day. And here's hoping that the next time we can do this, it's in person, preferably at a live show in KX country. Me too, Mikey. So good to talk to you, brother.